Hi everyone, I'm Sam Locke and I'm this year's Youth Champion Award winner of Advocacy for Period. I'm here with Representative April Berg, who is Washington State's represent or the Washington State representative who sponsored House Bill 1273, which put period products in bathrooms for K through 12 and higher education institutions for free. Hi, Representative Berg. It's great to be here with you. Hi. Hi, Sam. It's great to see you. So when did you first become aware of menstrual equity and period poverty? Yeah, thank you for that question, Sam. Um, it, you know, for me, I think I've always been aware of it just as a woman going through life in educational settings and having those moments where you need access to product and realizing that my access was based on the fact whether or not I had a quarter in my pocket. But that said, um, having three girls of my own and talking with them about their struggles and their friends' struggles in schools and in school bathrooms is really what put it on my radar. And then specifically, um, just before this last session, my girls did an Instagram poll just asking their friends, you know, is this a problem? And if it is, what are some of the stories? And within an hour, we had probably 80 um, responses to that poll, in addition to some really heartfelt stories. And that's when it went, you know, ding, 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 I've got to do something in my new space as a policymaker. Thank you. That's great. That's definitely my experience too. In bathrooms in like middle school, mm -hmm. the machines were never filled. And if they were filled, you needed mm. to change. And I wasn't allowed to access my locker except during break times. And so there was no way for me to access money, access period products, unless I shoved them into my school uniform. Oh, wow. Um, and that, that definitely <laughs> resonates with me. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, God. Um, so I guess the question would be, how has this personally affected you? Yeah. And so for me, you know, again, period poverty, it's, um, and, and really menstrual equity has affected me as a woman, just in terms of the settings I'm in, the folks I'm with and advocating for, and realizing that, um, for instance, as we um, have more high stakes tests for students, that means the students that I'm serving and trying to do the right thing for might not have access to products they need during these high stakes tests, that my own daughters might not have access to products they need during the day at school. And then, of course, their friends um, and other family members not having access. And so for me personally, it's been um, really a matter of my educational advocacy, looking at menstruation as a potential barrier to girls and um, folks who um, menstruate, looking at that as a barrier for their educational access. So um, as a policymaker, it feels like it affects me every day because I always want to widen inclusivity and access to education for all students. That's so important. Um, so my next question is, how did you learn about my work to eradicate period poverty? Yes. Well, Sam, thank you so much for that question. And thank you so much for your work. And I will say your work preceded you. Um, as soon as I started asking questions about menstrual equity and ending period poverty for our students, um, your name and your work immediately came up as a stakeholder who has already been in this space. And so as a first term legislator, I cannot thank you enough for already um, kind of uh, telling the ground that we're, we're walking on and we're legislating on. And so as soon as I showed interest in this bill and in this topic, your name came up, your group came up and the work that you're doing. Um, and just, you know, as a legislator, working with advocates like you always makes legislation better. So even though I took a bill that had been previously thought of and in, in other sessions with your help and your work, I was able to make it better and much, much more inclusive. Thank you. That, that means a lot. <laughs> so Upon reflection, how have attitudes about menstruation changed throughout your life? Well, I will say um, one of the biggest changes is that men say the word menstruation. <laughs> And so when I was your age and when I was in school, oh my word, you could not get an adult male to say that word, to admit that process. And 
um, being able to be on the house floor on the people's house in our state and talk about menstruation and menstruation equity openly with my male colleagues has been absolutely amazing. And again, it's because of advocacy groups like yours and, and advocates like yourself who really move the needle in terms of making this not something to be embarrassed about, not something to, to kind of, you know, whisper and use, you know, all these conjured up terms to refer to, but really talking about menstruating and menstruating individuals. So that's really been the biggest change um, is being able to literally say the quiet parts out loud. Yeah, I am. As you say that, I'm I'm recalling Greece too, um, mm -hmm. in the reproduction science class scene, where they mm -hmm. call it mental stration. They don't even know what the yeah. word is. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many weird. problematic things with that movie, but that is one of them. <laughs> yeah, that that's one that stuck with me, um, and it's so true. I mean. Even 10 years ago, there was no way that men would use mm -hmm. that word. It was a dirty word, periods yeah. were a dirty word, yeah. dirty situation, and not just a fact of life. Absolutely, yeah. And we internalize that as, you know, myself being a young woman, you really internalize that as, as your own kind of, you know, hidden thing, thing you don't talk about your, you know, all those, you know, my monthly and my flow and aunt flow. It's like, you know, I'm menstruating and, and my, um, my girls who are younger in their teens right now, and they have a whole another terminology for putting it. It's very, very graphic when they talk about what's going on. And I, absolutely love that they lean into how their body's working. They're healthy, beautiful young women, and they're not ashamed of any part of their body any time of the month. Yeah, that's, and I think it's so important that we say these words out loud too, because mm -hmm. aside from taking away the stigma, it mm -hmm. makes people just feel more secure. Like absolutely. when I was in high school, it was common to walk up to a random girl and ask her for a tampon. Mm -hmm. And there's so much power in that, particularly when we're talking about period poverty, because it mm -hmm. gives a level of security to the students and to the kids who can't afford the products. Absolutely. Um, and now with this bill, it's going to be a thing of the past that we have to go ask someone else for a period product, which is mm -hmm. huge. Um, and just like a huge step in the right direction toward being open and honest about what's going on with our bodies. Absolutely. And hopefully, you know, I, as women, I think in menstruating individuals, we all carry, you know, sometimes extra product, right? Like I, if I go somewhere, I'll say, oh, let me just throw a couple extra things because maybe someone needs it. You know, it'd be great if, um, if, men and, and folks who don't menstruate start doing the same thing <laughs> because I'd love to be able to ask anybody, you know, anywhere for help when I need it and have them have access to those products because they know even if it's not for them, somebody else might need it. So then what are your hopes for youth activists like me and like my peers? Oh my gosh, I have so many hopes for you, Sam. <laughs> I can, I literally, um, and I say that with, with this huge smile and this really excited heart because the activists like you, my hope is that you keep pushing and that you keep doing and that um, understanding that you're making amazing and great strides, that you're never kind of like dissuaded by any types of setbacks, but knowing that we still have work to do. And so even as we talk about this bill that passed and we talk about the great advocacy work, it's not at a termination point. It's not like, oh, great. We we solved it. Woo. It's, it's no, we did it. And now we have to do more. And so for advocates like yourself and for youth activists, I just want you to keep pushing, keep pressing and keep folks like me, keep policymakers super accountable to the policies that we're passing and how to make them better. Cause I can't say this enough nationwide, Sam, the changes that you helped our office put into this bill are literally going to touch everybody in every state because now they see what's possible. And that's the power of you youth advocacy and never stopping. Um, and you remember that Saturday we got together because I know you had talked to other legislators and then we all got together on the Saturday, like, let's do this. Let's figure out how to get to yes, right? It wasn't, and, and it was hard because our staff said, I don't, I don't know how we're going to get there. And I said, well, I don't know either, but let's talk with our youth advocates who are on the ground. They're very much 
um, you know, they want all the same things, but we got to figure out how to get to yes. And so for advocates like yourself, keep working with policymakers to get us to yes, we'll all be better for it. Yeah, that's, that's so important. I think, I think there's so much more work that can be done that hasn't even been touched yet. Like, absolutely more work around endometriosis and illnesses yes. that kill people like I have endometriosis and it's debilitating at times yep and yep. so ha just changing attitudes around you know having people with endometriosis being able to work from home when they need to mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. the products available so they don't bleed through their clothing Absolutely. Having more than just a hot pad on hand. Because yes. a hot yes. pad in the schools will do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, that's, I think that's my big next move is obviously continuing working on trans inclusion in the movement because there is so much more that needs to happen there. But mm -hmm. also looking at menstrual illnesses, um, yeah. endometriosis, adenomyosis, PCOS. Mm -hmm. All of these things, which affect one in 10 people with uteruses. Yeah. Um, I just think there's a lot of work to be done there. <laughs> there is a lot of work and there's a lot of um, destigmatizing and then also just, you know, really talking about it. Because I think, again, my hope for the youth is that you keep talking about it because as, as, as people with uteruses, right? We know about these diseases. We know about these chronic diseases and the impacts they take on our lives. And unfortunately, generationally, we were taught to just kind of hide it, buckle up, get through it, smile when you're given the hot pad and say, thank you, right? And that's that's not it. That's not the that's not where we should be. And it's not healthy. And so um, I think as we move on, I think if we can really start talking about menstruation rate related illnesses and how to really help folks in that space, that's going to be a powerful conversation that maybe in 10 years, we've got some more legislation passed that really meets folks where they're at. Yeah, yeah, that would just be incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really looking forward to it. It's something that I know the Red Sea Collective, which for those who aren't aware of it, is an organization I work with. Um, the Red Sea Collective is definitely looking at menstrual health care as a whole. Mm -hmm. and the particular illnesses which plague people with uteruses. Um, and we're looking at education, first and foremost, because the education just doesn't exist. Absolutely. Um, and really trying to get out there and do the good work. So, yeah, that's awesome. And then I guess my last question for you is do you have any words of wisdom? for me or fellow activists involved in the menstrual equity movement? Gosh, words of wisdom. I always feel like I get words of wisdom from you. So, so let's just put that out there. Um, but I think for me, you know, wisdom comes with knowledge, which leads to power, right? And so as you were just talking about education on menstruation related illnesses and what's that next step, making sure um, our correctional facilities are providing what they need for our menstruating individuals who are incarcerated, um, you know, making sure folks are actually implementing the laws that we have. So I think for me, the next step in the words of wisdom that I have for activists is be vigilant, be aware, show up um, and keep pressing because we're, we're just at the beginning of something amazing um, that should have happened years, if not decades ago. And so for you as youth activists, for you as advocates, just keep pushing and making things better in this space because I will tell you as a menstruating individual, um, legislation like this would have been so amazing when I was younger, but I can just think of all the amazing things that are gonna happen after this for, um, for folks again, nationwide, just not in our state. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of work that's going to occur and I'm really excited to see what happens. Absolutely, it's, it's exciting times, but it's also, um, also slightly terrifying. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, let's be real um, in the space that we're sitting in on the day that we're on, you know, there are some real attacks against women's reproductive rights and issues and, and that affects folks who menstruate, it affects all of us. And so um, being vigilant and keeping pressing is really necessary right now more than ever. Yeah, that, that reminds me of 
um, one of the times I testified, um, I actually was having a really bad day with my endometriosis. Mm. And so I actually, <laughs> in a spur of the moment decision, I sat there calculating how many tampons I would go through and how oh much gosh. blood I would lose in a period. And then I sat there and I moved my camera and showed them the heating pad I was sitting with as I was testifying. Wow. And it made the men in the room very uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. And that, but that's that sometimes you have to sit in that uncomfortable space to have change made, right? Like to really get folks to understand. And so I think that was probably, you put them in a good space. <laughs> So it's, yeah, that, oh, I, I, I feel for you because I have friends who suffer from endometriosis, um, fibroids and other uh, uterus related issues. And it is just the most agonizing pain that it's described to me. And so um, it's, yeah, being able to testify even in that state, I just, I just thank you again for all you do. Well, thank you. Um, and I think that's all I have for you. So Perfect. Thank you again for joining me for this call. It really means a lot to me. It means a lot to me that you've done all of this work and have been a mentor and peer and advocate because we never could have gotten this done without you. Oh, well, thank you so much for all your work, Sam. It's been great working with you on this and I'm excited about like the next step. Like we're like, this is just, we're going to keep this train moving. <laughs> awesome. Well, have a good rest of your day. You too. Thanks.